On the 10th of January 1954, a British Overseas Airways Corporation aircraft took off from Rome. It was heading for London and there were 35 people on board. As the plane was climbing to its cruising altitude, the captain was in contact with the ground when suddenly the transmission was cut off mid-sentence. Meanwhile, a group of fishermen were fishing off the coast of Elba Island and they heard a sound like thunder. They looked up in the air and they saw flaming wreckage streaming from the sky. It landed nearby and they went to investigate and they found debris and bodies floating in the water. This is the story of a plane crash that would change aviation safety. This is the story of the Comet aircraft. So the Comet aircraft went into service in 1952 and it was the world's first jet airliner. And this was a massive step forward. It could go twice the speed of existing propeller planes and it could fly twice as high. Now flying high had a number of important advantages. One of the really important one was that you were above the weather. You weren't flying through weather anymore, you were flying above it. The challenge for engineers was, though, that every time you went up to that height, you had to pressurise the cabin to make the cabin comfortable for the staff and the passengers. Now, that meant that the pressure on the inside of that cabin was higher than the pressure on the outside. So in essence, what happened every time this plane went up in the air was it got inflated like a balloon. The plane goes into service and it's not without incident. They had a number of crashes, but probably the most notable one happened in 1953 when a plane took off from Calcutta, India, and it disintegrated in mid-air, killed all 43 people on board. Now, there was a violent thunderstorm on at the time, and that was what was blamed for this incident. But now... We fast forward to where we began this story, the 10th of January 1954. And this is only eight months after the Calcutta crash and we've had our second mid-air disintegration. Now what made this January 1954 incident different to Calcutta was there was perfect weather. So weather couldn't be blamed for the mid-air disintegration. And the other interesting thing was they found really strange injuries on the bodies that they retrieved. They found they had fractured skulls and ruptured lungs. Just what could have caused injuries like this? The investigation had to get serious. And Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister at the time, dispatched the Royal Navy to do the really difficult task of retrieving the debris from 150 metre deep water. It was going to be a really big task. The Royal Navy started doing this. They started to attach debris to a timber frame in what now is very familiar to us who see aircraft investigations, but this was one of the first times it was done on a large scale. And they made a breakthrough when they found the tail of the plane because what they found was that the tail of the plane was filled with passenger belongings and debris. And this told them that the fuselage of the plane had ruptured prior to the tail being broken off. The fuselage gets ruptured, air rushes in and it blows the belongings back up into the back of the plane. That's the only way that can happen. So it looks like the fuselage has disintegrated. Now, while this investigation was going on, there was huge political pressure and commercial pressure to get these aircrafts back into service. So 10 weeks after the failure, the pressure mounted and the decision, a very fateful decision, was made to return the Comet to service, despite not knowing what had caused this Alba crash. But this decision would turn out to be a very bad one. Just three months after the Alba crash and only 16 days after they decided to put the Comet back in service, a Comet is taking off from Rome airport and it disintegrates in midair. The weather is fine and all 21 people on board are killed. Now they've had two comet disintegrations in midair in a three-month period and they start to worry that the Calcutta crash may not have been related to the weather at all but in fact may have been another midair disintegration. Now the challenge they have is that the Rome flight has ended up in the sea outside Naples in a thousand meters of water so it's going to be really hard to get to. So this puts the pressure right back on retrieving all the debris from the Elba crash and it's against this background that Winston Churchill appoints Sir Arnold Hall, Chief of the Royal Aircraft Establishment based at Farnborough, 
to investigate the fear and understand what has happened to the Comet aircraft. And he tells them, spare no expense, because the reputation of British aviation is on the line. So as the Royal Navy continued to collect debris, the investigation team led by Hall had a theory. They wanted to understand what happens to a plane if you suddenly depressurize it. So what they did was they built a model of the Comet. It was one tenth scale, they put seats in it, they put passengers in it, and then they suddenly punctured the fuselage and allowed depressurization. Now, what they found was that when you depressurize this plane, the air screams out, and as the air screams out, the seats are tore off the floor and the passengers are slammed into the roof of the plane. Now, this explains the head injuries that we saw in the victims of the crashes. The other thing that happens is that your lungs, because of the sudden depressurization, end up with a higher air pressure inside them than outside them, and this causes them to rupture like balloons. So now the investigation team could explain the injuries and, and they knew the cause of that was the sudden depressurization of the plane. But how could the plane depressurize? You know, the engineers who designed it understood that there was going to be higher air pressure inside the plane than outside it when it was up in the air. They designed the plane to withstand two and a half times this pressure. But even more than that, they tested each and every one of these planes when they were built, and they tested them to double the pressure that they would experience in service. The question was, had they missed something? And as far as Hall and the team were concerned, they had. And that thing was metal fatigue. So what is metal fatigue? Well, if we take a piece of metal and we stress it, and then we de-stress it, that metal may not fail. But what happens in metal fatigue is if we keep cycling the stresses, stressing and de-stressing, stressing and de-stressing, over time with some metals, what we find is that the stress that wouldn't cause a single failure will cause a failure over time. And this is called fatigue. And the investigation theme theory was that every time this plane went up in the air and got pressurized, that was stressing the fuselage. And then every time it landed, you were de-stressing the fuselage. So even though these fuselages were tested to two times the pressure that they sustain in a normal flight. The investigation theme's theory was that the repeated cycles at this lower stress for normal flight, that led to a fatigue failure and fatigue cracks in the fuselage, which ended up rupturing the fuselage. Now, how do you test this theory? Well, they really went for it. They took a real comet, they stripped everything out of it, and they put it in a giant water tank. They pumped it a tank full of water both inside and outside the plane and what they could do then was they could pump additional water into the fuselage which would increase the pressure inside the fuselage relative to the pressure outside it and they could do that until they got the pressure that they would expect in normal flights and then they could release that pressure so suddenly rather than having to fly the plane up and down in a matter of minutes they could produce a stress cycle similar to what the real plane would expect in flight. Now the engineers estimated that the fatigue life of this plane was around 10,000 cycles, or the equivalent of 10,000 pressurized flights. Now in the tank setup, this was going to take five months before they reached that number of cycles. But they didn't have to wait that long, because what they found was the plane failed in less than a month. It failed at 3,000 cycles. Now, this was actually more than the two planes that failed in service. One failed at around 1,200 cycles, one failed at 900 cycles. When they drained the tank and looked at the plane, they found that a crack had grown to a length of 2.4 metres and ripped a gash out of the side of the airplane. So they had their cause of fear. A rupture in the fuselage like this in mid-air, as opposed to being contained by the water in the tank, would result in the catastrophic failure of the fuselage and the damage to the people that we saw in the autopsies. Now these cracks, interestingly, originated from the windows in the comet. The windows of the comet were square with little rounded corners, and these square windows produced stress concentrations, so areas of high stress, where the cracks could initiate from. Now this failure of the comet had a massive impact on airline safety. There's a wonderful line by the author, D.D. Dempster, who wrote, 
No aircraft has contributed more to safety in the jet age than the Comet. The lessons it taught the world of aeronautics live in every jet airliner flying today. But of course, these lessons were only learned because of the diligent investigations that took place and the actions that were taken after to embed those learnings into aircraft design. So next time you're on a plane, take a look at the window beside you. You'll notice it's either round or oval. This is one of the most visible legacies of the comet crashes. <laughs>